Okay. Mike Williamson, Rancho Bay. Hi. Um, so uh, I, uh, last summer I was uh, given an offer of a job to join a, a new hedge fund that was starting up, which was, uh, which was incredibly exciting for me because I'd spent, I guess, about the past 15 years working in a number of established financial firms, both buy side and sell side, doing uh, primarily uh, trading and risk technology. And existing firms are just a seething morass of legacy technology. And I think probably what pretty much every IT guy dreams of is the ultimate green field. Like, this is it. There's nothing. The day I started, I was um, the whole of the IT department. And so um, basically, it was, it was kind of a once in a lifetime chance to say, right, we want to, uh, you know, we want to build everything we need for, uh, for an asset management firm that we, we hope is going to grow and be successful. Um, is this how we make the thing change? Oh, OK. So um, first, a little bit about, uh, about Renshaw Bay, who uh, probably, I'm guessing, a lot of people won't have heard of because, um, like I say, it is essentially a startup firm. Um, uh, Renshaw Bay was founded uh, recently uh, by Bill Winters, who used to be the co-CEO of JP Morgan's investment banking uh, operation globally. Um, Bill, after he left JP Morgan, spent a while on uh, the, the Independent Commission on Banking, uh, looking into banking and what went wrong and what needed to be done to fix it and what the future of banking was. And he, he concluded, as part of that process, that, that there were really fundamental changes going on in the financial markets and that many things that banks used to do, they weren't going to be able to do any, anymore, weren't going to want to do anymore in response to changing regulatory pressures, uh, capital pressures, and so forth. Um, and so he founded Renshaw Bay with the concept of focusing on certain kinds of, of um, opportunities that would come out of that process over the next several years. Um, so uh, there, there are a few different funds that we're looking to launch, but the one that's, for me, most interesting from kind of a technology standpoint is uh, what's going to be called the Structured Finance Opportunities Fund. And the idea behind this is that there are certain kinds of, of portfolios out there, um, the, the sort of toxic debris of the, of the credit crisis, if you will, that's sitting on banks' balance sheets that actually has intrinsic value in it. Uh, that can be unlocked if you can analyze it properly and if you can buy it and hold it to, uh, to maturity. So the fund is being structured. I guess I, sh I should, as a, as a caveat, admit right now, it's not actually a, a hedge fund in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, it's, it's more like a hybrid between a hedge fund and a private equity structure because the vehicles we're putting together require uh, a substantial uh, long-term lockup um, and, and capital commitments, you know, over say a five to seven year period from uh, what what we expect will be large institutional investors. Um, but from from the point of view of building out the technology for it, the, the sorts of things we need are, um, to a large extent, uh, like what you would find in in any other sort of asset manager that you're starting. So. Um, for the purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to focus on the core uh, strategic applications that you need for an asset management firm, or at least for our firm, which are what I'll call a portfolio management system. Um, first of all, I think it's important to mention that there's no such thing as standard terminology in this space. And if you go out there and start looking at vendors and systems, you'll, use, you'll hear all kinds of different terms used to refer to different kinds of systems that have, you know, in some cases, highly overlapping, in other cases, widely different kinds of functionality. Um, but when I say a portfolio management system, from the point of view of the kinds of things that we're going to be looking at, it means uh, trade booking, position keeping, uh, post-trade life cycle processing, uh, managing uh, corporate actions, for example, or defaults uh, within credit derivative portfolios. Um, and then the kind of nuts and bolts of running an asset manager, which means communicating the trades that you do to uh, your prime brokers or your administrators or your clearinghouses and so forth, uh, and, and basically uh, supporting the post-trade operational side of the business, um, which 
uh, you know, may be more or less outsourced, but, uh, as Kirk mentioned before, but to the extent that you're carrying out these processes in-house, uh, either as, as the primary uh, uh, agent of those processes or in some cases kind of shadowing the processes of your administrators or prime brokers. Uh, you, you want a good system to do that. You want a system that's got uh, strong controls and that's got uh, uh, strong audit trails around it and so forth so that you can, uh, you can hold yourself up to your investors as someone who's got good infrastructure in place. Um, and then second, and uh, from our point of view, most critically, uh, uh, a system for doing uh, analysis and risk management of our complex derivatives portfolios. So uh, uh, with a focus initially on credit products, uh, but including certainly interest rate products and possibly in the future equity products as well. Um, so I break these out as two different applications because that's how we see them internally. Although if you go out and look at the space of vendors out there, there will be uh, many vendors, for example, that uh, claim to be able to do all of those things all wrapped into one. Um, so uh, briefly, I'll mention also IT infrastructure because um, you can't run any business without that. And, and as a CTO, I'm kind of responsible for seeing that we have that as well. Um, you know, the usual stuff that you'd need for running any kind of business. But then also, in particular, for what we're doing, uh, a vast amount of processing power. Um, apologies if you can't all see this back there. Um, I was expecting like a much higher sort of screen. Um, uh, the kinds of portfolios that we're looking about potentially taking on from banks uh, are underpinned in big financial institutions by uh, calculation grids of thousands or in some cases tens of thousands of cores. Um, the, the kinds of calculations that you need to do to calculate values and, and risk sensitivities and scenarios on, on very large complex derivatives portfolios requires just a vast amount of processing power. So as a startup uh, uh, fund manager, that's, that's kind of a, a challenge. Um, and then, of course, obviously, there's lots of other technology you need, but I'm just not going to talk about that today. Um, so uh, first, I'll talk about the infrastructure just a bit, because that's obviously the, the foundation upon which you have to build all the rest of the firm. Um, for the basic IT platform, uh, what uh, we found to, uh, you know, to our um, relief is that there are people out there that will just make this problem go away for you. So having worked in, in banks or bigger, more established firms that had done all of this internally um, and had a, a substantial amount of the IT staff dedicated to doing kind of pure infrastructure, you know, Windows, Unix, networking, routers, telecoms, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and in fact, even to some extent procure, procurement as well. There are, uh, are firms now that will give you like a complete turnkey offering um, that are very much focused on um, financial services. Um, I, I've kind of made an executive decision not to name specific vendors' names uh, kind of on the record, although if you're interested, ask me later. Um, we've gone with one that's focused on financial services. They understand what we need. They provide essentially investment bank caliber of IT infrastructure um, that, uh, that really meets our needs extremely well. Um, uh, the one thing that they don't particularly do is provide vast amounts of, uh, of processing power. Uh, that's, that's just not something they're geared up to do. Um, they would do it at a price, but that price uh, looked like it was going to be prohibitive. Um, so we're using a, a sort of hybrid approach here. Our first approach is to use the on-site IT plant that, that any firm would typically have to its best advantage. So you know we've got 40-some people in our company. Uh, we've therefore got 40-some uh, computers in the office, some of which are really quite high-end engineering workstations. They sit there doing uh, pretty much nothing all night long, at least, and often during the day. Um, so by building out internal infrastructure that we can deploy across all our in-house desktop machines, we, uh, we can actually like, harness quite a lot of computing horsepower. Um, However, that's got two problems. One, there isn't enough of it. And two, uh, in some sort of disaster scenario in which our building burned down, there wouldn't be any of it at all. And, and we still need to be able to trade uh, and risk manage our book in that circumstance. So the second thing we've done is turn to public cloud computing. Uh, we evaluated a couple of different cloud vendors, um, decided to go with EC2 for now because um, 
Uh, it, it's big, it's well established that APIs are clean and easy to use. Um, so we've built out our, our in-house infrastructure to be able to uh, combine together uh, our desktop PC computing power plus uh, machines in the Amazon cloud, which um, in theory anyway, we should be able to scale up to thousands of cores uh, in a relatively short time. Um, and in particular that because of the, uh, the pricing model, you only pay for what you actually use, which very much suits the sorts of uh, uh, calculations that we might do where you might say on an ad hoc basis want to price uh, your portfolio under some scenario in which you'd need to like spin up maybe hundreds or thousands of cores for an hour or two, but you don't wanna, want to have purchased that many uh, to be sitting around all the time doing nothing. So uh, turning then to the two main application areas. Um, I think you know, what Kirk said in his, in, in his talk is exactly right. Um, and in fact, the fact that we hadn't colluded beforehand um, uh, surprised me a bit how, how much everything he said resonated with the decisions that I had to make and the experiences I had over the past um, year or so. Um, so for the core trade booking, position keeping, nuts and bolts, back office, workflow, audit trails, reconciliations, that sort of thing, um, we decided to go with a vendor system because it's largely a commoditized activity and there, there's no advantage at all in building all that from scratch. So we started by uh, uh, doing a survey of the market. Uh, in, in answer to your question before, how do we find out what systems are out there? For us, the prime brokers were a goldmine of, in, of information, right? They, all, all of the major prime brokers will be able to tell a startup hedge fund like us, oops, not a hedge fund, startup alternative asset manager, um, uh, what other systems are out there, how they're being used, who they're being used by, uh, what their market penetration is. So that gave us like a really good, uh, a really good starting point. Um, it's a market that is currently, I'd say, sp split over sort of three tiers. There's a top tier of really big, well-established players that have been around for a long time, who sell into primarily investment banks, but try and get into the hedge fund space as well. Um, it, it's a bit like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. They were way too big, certainly way too expensive, uh, geared up, as Kirk said, for uh, procurement processes that were gonna be quite heavyweight, and, um, uh, and in the end, we weren't something that we really wanted to tangle with. Um, there's kind of a middle tier of companies that have been around and are uh, well-established, um, but, but not that big and not that heavyweight, but ultimately, in the end, uh, we ended up going with uh, a, essentially a startup company. Uh, there are a handful of new players in this market at various degrees of maturity. I think there might be representatives of a few of them here. Um, the one we ended up going with had been around for a few years, had uh, a very deep uh, history in the industry, uh, very, very clear understanding of, of what the systems needed to do, um, had built a system that had amazingly rich functionality on a clean modern technology stack, but most importantly, from our point of view, they built a system that, although it's not open source in the way that Open Gamma is, is extremely customizable, flexible, and extensible. It was a product that we were highly confident that we would be able to make do whatever we wanted to do, um, either by working with the vendor, who, because they were small and very responsive and were willing to engage with us very, very closely, or ultimately, if necessary, by, um, by taking the system entirely in hand and, uh, and making changes to it ourselves. So um, that was that. Um, for the analytics and risk management platform, this uh, was a decision that was essentially made by our portfolio manager that we would do it all in-house. He had had bad experiences working in banks before with vendor systems that uh, were slow and complex and, and unresponsive in terms of his ability to affect change to them. So he basically made an executive decision that we would have our own in-house quant team, we would build our own in-house analytics libraries, and we would build our own in-house uh, risk management system. Um, so our approach to doing that, uh, based partly on personal biases and, and partly on um, the people that, uh, that I put together in my team, was to do it all using Python as a programming language. 
Um, and this is where uh, I wasn't quite sure how to pitch this talk because I've never been to this group before, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be mainly IT guys or mainly people interested in finance or whatever. So I'll probably take this middle ground that's neither sufficiently technically detailed for any IT guys in the audience, but too techy for the people who aren't interested. But anyway, um, we, uh, we went for Python because uh, uh, it, it's a fantastic language for doing the kinds of development, building the kinds of infrastructure that we need. Uh, two of the senior developers that I hired had come from other firms that are doing a substantial amount of Python development. It's something that's been taken up, I think, by a lot of the banks as well. Uh, as well as in the scientific and engineering research communities. Um, it, it really let us build out a tremendous amount of uh, distributed pricing and risk infrastructure very, very quickly, um, and, uh, uh, and to keep the code base small and manageable. Um, there's there's a, a huge uh, community out there that's produced a lot of, a lot of infrastructure and uh, just lots of stuff that you can leverage. Um, that, I mean, if, if nothing else, that was our goal, was to leverage open source technology as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and the Python community is great for that. Um, the, the GUIs uh, are largely built around Excel, because that's what traders want to use anyway. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, Excel. It can be very valuable and very useful. It can also be extremely dangerous. So our goal is to focus on not having ever any business logic in Excel, but to use Excel spreadsheets essentially as a sort of container to deploy front ends to the trading desks, backed onto the underlying computational infrastructure. Um, although we have built some, some bespoke GUIs uh, using, using a, a, a Python widget set, and we've also uh, built some web-based GUIs for, uh, for essentially a sort of reporting and dashboard onto the underlying risk management system. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about some open source technology that we've used that has worked really extremely well for us and, um, and, and given us, I think, a huge amount of value for, for well, no cost. Um, the core of, uh, of any sort of trading system, obviously, has got to be uh, your database. And we spent a bit of time up front thinking, like, wow, all the cool kids today are all about these NoSQL databases. That's what they're doing out there in the web community, big data, um, you know, all the buzzwords and such. And we looked into some of that technology. And in the end, we decided that, um, uh, cool kids aside, relational databases actually have a lot of value. Um, to the extent that there is value to be had from the, the NoSQL approach to doing things, from our point of view, we could get that by using uh, Postgres, which is primarily a relational database, but that has support for uh, JSON blobs within it. So a lot of the advantages that you would get out of using something like Mongo or Couchbase, um, you can get uh, out of Postgres. Obviously, not necessarily some of the big data or, or sharding or anything like that. But um, for, our, for our point of view, this kind of hybrid between SQL and NoSQL is working out very well for us. Um, there's some other great open source components out there that I mentioned because uh, in, in banks, um, they really love their vendor technology. And uh, for message queuing, for example, banks would often have been using you know, Sonic or TIBCO EMS or TIBCO Rendezvous or other solutions like that. In fact, there's fantastically good open source software out there that's come out of the web development community that lets you build stuff um, that uh, I think is of the same nature that you would have built in banks by stapling together different kinds of vendor systems, um, but uh, obviously at a fraction of the cost. Um, another, uh, another thing that we've uh, been playing with and really love is uh, MonetDB. It's a column store database. Um, it's let us do things that, uh, that um, I really only kind of uh, dreamed about. Um, so that, along with a whole bunch of different uh, Python technology that uh, um, has given us you know, a huge leg up, the ability to do things extremely quickly. Um, so uh, the kind of takeaway from all this is that by, by using... First of all, on the one hand, things like vendors that can provide you uh, as a service all of your infrastructure, the cloud computing, um, by working with small startup vendors who can engage with you very well and can be very responsive, 
but then in particular to the extent that you want to build stuff in-house by putting together your own IT team and leveraging uh, what's available in the, in the landscape today, you can actually build out a tremendous amount of infrastructure in a very quick time. And uh, uh, about eight months into it now, we're, uh, we're just on the, on the eve of launching our credit fund and uh, are, are quite satisfied with what we've been able to put together. So any questions about any of that? Questions for Mike? Hi, oh, thanks for that. Actually mirrored a lot of my own experiences when I was doing something similar, so quite nice to hear that. Um, when you're talking about uh, outsourcing to the sort of more nimble, smaller vendors for your portfolio management system, um, did you, I mean, obviously there's a lot of advantages in doing that because they're very responsive to you. They can get, you know, support is generally better, quick. Um, were you worried about sort of acquisition risk and potentially, you know, some bigger firm coming and buying them up and, or, or any other kind of risks to, you know, because obviously these uh, smaller vendors are a lot more subject to risk in that regard. And how would that have affected your fund? Would you have been able to rapidly deal with that risk and, and uh, you know, progress? Yeah, that's a really good question. They're actually like, they're the two major risks that you have when you go with a small vendor. You've gone with them because you think you're going to have an intimate relationship. You're going to get uh, a very high level of service. In our case, this vendor we're working with are almost like an extension of our in-house technology team. It's the sort of place that you can send them an email on a Friday night with a bug report, and they'll have a new version of the software on Monday morning. Um, the risk, there are two risks, um, and you walk a line between them. One is that they'll fail, and the other is that they'll succeed. <laughs> and, you know, uh, be taken over, just grow to the extent that they take on too many clients and, and you can't get the level of service that you can anymore. Um, in our case, we were able to mitigate that through contractual arrangements. Um, I can't, can't go into a lot of details, but the essence of it is that, you know, that we're confident that um, we can protect our investment in their technology. Uh, I mean, obviously you'd have something like an escrow agreement in any case if a software vendor failed. Um, but what you want to protect yourself against is them not being able to provide the level of support that you need, not just that they'll fail financially. And, um, and we just addressed that as part of the contract in a way that, that left us confident. Did you feel it had a bit of lock-in with that vendor, or was it, would it have been easy to rapidly move to another vendor? Uh, it will never be easy to rapidly move to another vendor. Um, <laughs> That's, that's why you need to make that particular decision quite carefully, is once you put a, a vendor system in as a core trading system, the thing you're using for your, your trade capture and as the hub of all, all of your kind of middle to back office processing within your firm, uh, and, and have used something like that for a couple of years, you're going to be so deeply embedded into it that moving away from it to another system is going to be a monumental uh, monumental project. So you've got to be very confident that what you're going with you want to live with for years and years um, and that, you know, if necessary, you can, you can make it work yourself. Yeah, I'm Sundar Annam Raju. Uh, my question is, just like we were talking about the contractual um, agreements with the small vendor, uh, what is your experience in dealing with cloud computing vendors or providers of infrastructure service? How, how much of a cloud did you have in the negotiation or were you tied into their standard terms and conditions? Um, yeah, we didn't do anything there. I mean, as a startup firm ourselves, the, we did look at a couple of different uh, cloud computing providers. I did you know, some Google searching around and you know, tried to go and look at the pricing and things. Um, whipped out the corporate credit card, typed it into the Amazon web form, and we were away. Um, you know, there's going to be some point at which maybe we want to... Uh, to reevaluate this, um, and it's something. I mean, the nice thing about uh, Amazon EC2 in particular is you can just jump right in. It costs you know nothing, or you know, um, you know, a few dollars a month, depending on the extent to which you want to scale up. Obviously, you need to be a bit careful because if your software goes berserk and launches 10,000 instances, you might get a big bill at the end of the month. But um, you know, you really can kind of like you know, uh, you know, go go on a pay-as-you-go basis and, you know, go in, into it as deep as you want. And um, I think the, the one thing, if we'd had more time, I probably would have tried to look at is I think there are out there some abstraction layers that give you 
a kind of generic API that you could use to back on to a, uh, multiple cloud vendors so that you avoid the vendor lock-in rather than doing what we did, which was build stuff specifically around, um, well, a, a Python package that gives you an interface to, to Amazon. Um, but, you know, we just didn't have the time to do that and didn't hugely see the need. Hi, I'm Robert Betts from Nevo Partners. Um, Mike, uh, a question we were talking about early on, but um, the question about working with a startup vendor, do you think because you've gone through the process and the pain of uh, dealing with big vendors before, um, whether you are slightly different or do you think there might be a trend? Um. I don't know, it's hard for me to know how much to generalize on that point. I know uh, our, our head portfolio manager on the credit side wasn't excited about working with, uh, with big vendors. There's some that he mentioned by name that he absolutely refused to work with. Um, I think mostly it would, have, it would have depended a lot on the experience that people like that had, had with banks. Um, to be honest, I don't know very many people who have actually had good experiences with really big software vendors. <laughs> um, I've actually had some you know, some qualified successes with some, um, but, uh, but I don't know of anyone who really thinks it's, it's a great way to spend money or time. Um, it was actually, it was a big debate in our firm early on whether or not we could go with a startup vendor or whether, as a startup ourselves, to reassure our investors, we needed to go with, um, with a, a more established player. Um, uh, and it's something we debated at length. And in, in the end, we came to the conclusion that, and, and we did actually some kind of external research asking around people at other funds and so forth, um, what their experience had been when going through due diligence with investors, um, and came to the conclusion that investors care about you having good controls in place uh, and, and having you know, thought about the potential risks and mitigated them, but that going with a startup vendor isn't, isn't a huge impediment. But, you know, uh, like I say, there was, there was debate on that point in our firm, so I would imagine in some other firms the debate might come down the other way. Hi, I'm Ken. Um, given you'll be dealing with some pretty exotic portfolios, what's your stance on real-time risk reporting? Um, are you going to be building your technology stack to return real-time risk analytics or take advantage of the cloud, or is it not designed that way? Um, not real time, no. Um, and that was something that I personally was, I mean, I'd love to build real time risk systems. It would be fun. Um, I was hoping I could, but the head portfolio manager has, has reassured me on numerous occasions that's not something he needs. The liquidity of the instruments, the nature of the kinds of risks, his experience having run structured products in, in banks before, um, these kinds of portfolios. Well, to give you some idea of the sort of portfolio we're talking about, one of the one of the ones that we've been looking at has on the order of fifty thousand positions in it. Uh, you know, forty or so thousand vanilla credit derivatives and a few thousand bespoke tranches, CDO squareds, and so forth. The pricing models for the more complex products might take a minute or so of CPU time to run a single pricing for a single instrument. Um, if you then need to do many pricings to calculate different kinds of sensitivities, uh, you, your time bucketed credit and interest rate exposure and so forth, um, uh, you sit down and do all the maths and you're looking at probably something like um, 300 core hours of CPU time to price the portfolio. So. Um, no one's expecting to see like real time ticking risk in that. Oh, I don't know, maybe some of Kirk's clients are. Um, but from our point of view, uh, certainly overnight batch runs, but intraday maybe taking a segment of the portfolio and defining an ad hoc scenario and being able to fire something off into the grid um, and get a response back within you know, an hour would be, it would be completely acceptable to our, to our trading desk and risk managers. Hey, we can we can take one more one more question. Is there any interest in uh, using GP GPU to actually help with those sort of calculations? There's a lot of floating point maths in there. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. It's something our um, uh, some of our developers and quants are really really interested in. Um, for sure, we think for some of the pricing models that would help out a tremendous amount. 
And um, from the point of view, so our, our internal kind of organizational structures, we've got the quants who build the analytics library and then the technology team who builds the, uh, the IT framework with those models embedded within it. Um, GPU enabling it is something that would have to be done by the quant team within the core of the analytics library. Having done that, you could then just have models which would go faster, which you could deploy into our framework. Um, interestingly, um, Amazon has GPU enabled nodes within their cloud, so you know, our current solution, if the, if the quants get around to doing that, would, um, would definitely give us a huge benefit for some of the models. Just take one, one last one. It's Greg Dowling. It's sort of a follow-on question, really. Did the quants write the models in Python? No. Sadly not. Um, I wish they had, because we didn't quite get there soon enough. Um, the, the head quant was in the firm before I was and had uh, really established himself in C++, as, as many old school quants are want to do. Um, I actually think that's not as ridiculous as an idea as some people might think. Um, Python itself is obviously not uh, on the face of it, a really high performance programming language, although some of the Python modules like NumPy actually give you, a, you know, surprisingly good performance. But then more interestingly is Cython, which essentially lets you write something with very much Python-like syntax, but then compile it into native code. And, uh, you know, I've seen benchmarks where algorithms implemented in Cython get performance that's pretty close to, to native C++. So, um, uh, if I'd had a chance to brainwash our quant soon enough, maybe it would have been, but sadly, no. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.